fought with the Australians. They're all mixed up in that pond. Mm -hmm. There it is. It was just there. Did you find it? I found it. What okay. was it under? I had to download one. Samsung voice recorder. Okay. Wow. Wow. All right. So you weren't in Alpha Troop. You weren't in Second Squadron. I was in Charlie Battery. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's cool. So you were busy. So you said that it was better to be in that versus being behind the guns. And you're saying just for your own safety. I was trained on the guns. I was never trained in the fire, in the fire direction center. I was trained and I wasn't trained as a radio operator either. But when I got over there, the need was for those two positions. You, you, if you were a radio yeah. operator, then you could have been in a number of positions. You could have been on the field with the grunts. Yeah. Uh, and usually they're with the point men. And that's one of the most dangerous positions you want to be in. Because you are out there with your captain and the squad. And you're feeling your way through all kinds of debris and, and uh, sh uh, shrubs and canopies. And you're finding out where these grunts are, where the gooks are. Well, that's always what you see in the movies, is the guy who has this, tele this telephone whip. receiver. It's called a whip on his back. They have a short whip. Yeah. And he's right next to the captain, because he's the one that calls in the fire. fire. So he calls them to you guys? He can call them to us, or he can call them to the airplanes. If he's under attack immediately, then they call the jets, or the cobras. Mm -hmm. And the Cobras are the gunships. They'll come in there and they'll just spray them mm -hmm. with 50 millimeter uh, guns. And that, that'll cut trees down. Mm -hmm. And that'll protect them instantly. But if they think there's somebody out in, the, out in front of them, they don't know where, it's a lot less expensive to call in the artillery than to put the gas in a man's life and a plane that's mm -hmm. valued at millions of dollars in jeopardy mm -hmm. or a helicopter. So that's usually how it works. It doesn't always work that way. Some people just, they don't care. They just want immediate protection or scared. So the command comes into the fire direction center and that's now me. I used to be, I was trained on the 155s and the 105s, but the, the uh, section that I had was the 105s, and in the 105s, we had three 155s, which reach out further than the other guns. So we could have had nine in our battery, we could have had three and three in our battery, or we could have had six 105s in our battery. So, so when you told Luke that that was a better position to be in, you're safe, saying a safer. safer position. And because the people who are doing the guns, yes. well, then obviously the enemy knows where it's coming from, so they're going to be shooting at the guns. Correct. So how far away were you from the guns? I was in the center of all six guns, dead center. Like if the guns are all standing on a hill, you're up no, there on no, a hill. No, they're in a what? circle. The guns are in a circle. Oh, my word. And, and you're in the middle? And what they did is they did... Well, how big is the circle? Well, it's uh, it's spread out. I'm not sure exactly the diameter of the circle anymore, but it could have been 50 or 100 feet in a circle, and you're, they were placed in strategic positions around that circle. So that they were all equal, because you don't want to be on, you don't want to spin your barrel around and you look down, down, down the other side, the other guy's barrel, but mm -hmm. you don't want to be out of that circle. So how on earth could you hear <laughs> if they're yelling quadrants and turning well, over? Well, those those commands only come into the fire direction center. They don't come into the guns. The guns don't act unless the fire direction center gives them authority to do something. I want you to tell us more about that thing I posted on Veterans Day. You've never told me that story. I don't know what it was. That then. day of... The incoming. Of, yeah, you were under attack. You were, you, uh, you were helping people to safety, and you had that bravery and courage thing. And they said, you know, you, you were really helped to make a success.
successful mission. Without you, it w maybe wouldn't have turned out that way, they said. I don't remember them saying all that. That's what it said. It did? It, it said that you were vital in being the success of Well, that and, and vital in saving. Something like that. And we got, you gave us the thing. I can go yeah, but I don't remember saying all that. Anyhow. Matthew, you go show them. Oh, I know what it said. Well, just tell everybody what you did. Well, I was halfway through the year because I wrote it in my Bible. And it was in Psalms 52 I was reading. I have it underlined. I can't remember exactly the verse right now. I can look it up. Mark. But it had something to do with uh, being being not afraid, but being close to God, and God would protect you. And um, it, this was after we were under attack, till we got our feet back underneath us, got our sandbags filled again, till we uh, uh, evaluated our damages. Because you got to get back on your feet. Just because you got hit once doesn't mean you're not going to get hit again. And you can't take a chance and just cry over spilt milk. You, you got to react. Well, this guy, unfortunately or unfortunately, it depends how you look at it. There were National Guards that thought that because they signed up for the National Guards. Are you listening? I'm trying to. Be nice and loud. National okay. Since they signed up with the National Guards, they thought they would never go to Vietnam. Well, guess what? There were sergeants, there were, there were corporals and sergeants, which outranked privates right away. And when I went in country, I was a private. But immediately, therefore, I went up the lines. And uh, I was a, a specialist, a, 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 PR, a P, yeah, PFC, which is uh, one bar with a, a hoop underneath it. And then you go from there to a corporal or a specialist. And then the next step up is, is a sergeant or a specialist. And um, they thought they would never be drafted. Well, they were drafted and they were ticked. Because the guy, that, the guy that I served with, he had his own business. He was a CEO of a business, and he flew airplanes. And uh, then there was Don Davis, who was a National Guard, and he only had one more year to go before he would be out of his commitment, and they drafted him. And there must have been six of those guys in our, in our battery. Only because our battery got hit was almost devastated before I got in country in the Asha Valley, which was north where they overran us just about. They, they cornered us in a valley from both sides. They, were, they picked on, picked us off. The gooks? Yeah, and we lost pretty close to half of our battery. Our Charlie battery is almost half lost. And then when I got in country, they said, oh boy, here comes fresh blood. They're not going to last long. That was what we heard. Was Charlie Battery a uh, 2,000-man group, or was this a smaller 200-man group? Yeah, it was smaller. There was, there was four batteries in a company, or four companies in a battery. And uh, the batteries could have been 250, um, not, more than four, not more than 500, that's for sure. And they had like four of those in a battery. And then, uh, well, your platoon, your squad, your platoon, your company, your your battery. And then there's another one over that. I don't know what that is. So anyway, they were ticked. And a lot of them were really mad that they were drafted. And they were afraid for their life because they, they protected themselves all the way up this line. And Don Davis... He was a sergeant, and um, you know, a fun guy and that, but the day that we got hit, I had just gotten off a watch. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, and, the, and I just got off my watch. I was just ready to get back into my hooch, which was made out of a culvert, these big metal things that they have you'll see them along the roadside it's almost as big as a sewer pipe you know that, it's yeah like a tent? yeah well they're they're half pieces and what you do fortunately for us 
with being an artillery, we had empty ammo boxes. So what we do is when they when the guns land on the LZ, they take out all the all the all the uh, shells, all the bullets, if you will, shells, and they stack them uh, along along the bat along the pair. There's a, a pit that's called a pair pit. And that's where your gun sits in the middle, and then you have sandbags all around that. Well, you got to fill those sandbags up, and you got to fill them up so high, and they have to be too deep. And then uh, uh, four layers over, over top of the ammo, because if they if they come down and they hit that, then then it so blows up all the shells all over everybody. So they had to protect the ammo. So we had empty ammo boxes. So we filled the ammo boxes with dirt. And uh, we made them four high, and then we put the culvert over the top so that you could enter your hutch with just bending over. And then you built a wall in front of each of those two, but a little space so you could get in and out of either end so you'd never be trapped. And then we draped mosquito netting over those so you could sleep in there pretty, pretty nice, you know. You still could hear hear the guns and the, and the uh, fl uh, Wilson Pickett flares and all that stuff go off at night, um, but that's where we were. Now the, the the regular guys they did the same thing, they they built theirs that way. But the fire direction center had one sleeping quarters because there was only eight of us, two shifts of four. And I had just gotten off the shift. Is the fire direction center inside the battery? It's inside. It's inside our company, Charlie Company. It's okay. inside the company. And uh, I didn't know about a ra how to operate a radio and the signals to say, and I was taught that very quickly. And then I didn't know much about charts, how to how to look for uh, longitude and al altitude and uh, the grids. And uh, you had to study the maps and the terrains. And the maps weren't always correct. You had all kinds of crazy valleys. You had so much overgrowth with the trees. And when the maps were drawn up, you didn't have that kind of overgrowth. So it got a little difficult trying to figure out the altitude. And we had to figure that out. Then you had to figure out how many charges that you had to give the guns in order to get the projectile to hit correctly over the heads of the grunts that are out there. The grunts are the uh, advanced uh, infantry that goes out and scouts so that you don't blow them up. Well, er at nighttime, and they usually, these guys usually wanted to get covered right away because they had to dig foxholes and get in. So sometimes they send in their quadrants. Uh, they radio them in. This is uh, Alpha, Alpha 4. Uh, we I send in our quadrants to you and they would tell us where they are, how many degrees this way, that way, and then we would take that immediately and put it on the map. We had a big map and you plot it on there with a push pin and you'd label it. So we knew where they are. Well, there's four, there's four of those squads, one north, south, east, and west out there. So we had to do it for four squads and you had to know where they were. Well, sometimes those guys were lost. They thought they went by the maps. They thought their compass was correct. But with that overshadowing trees and shrubs, they, they, most of the time they weren't always on target. And then before we would settle in at night, before they would settle in at night, they'd say, uh, send a, um, I think they did a white, yeah, we did a white phosphorus. That's a Wilson, they say Wilson Pickett. Uh, charge four because they were out there about 2,000, 3,000 feet or more. So we give them a, a Wilson picket that told that they could see that. Then they said, Repeat with a, a hotel echo, that's a hot round. So we repeat with a hotel echo, and they'd say, Okay, that's fine. Sometimes they'd say, Oh my gosh, this freaking thing is right on me, back off, you know, because they were lost. So then, so then we'd have to adjust that, make sure we were right, and they wouldn't move all night. They would stay in that position, and uh, then, then they went. But they to, would verify their coordinates by having you shoot at them. The, well, basically, yes, 
they would give us they would give us uh, 800 feet in front of them or 800 feet to the left or the right whatever so that we so that they knew that when we called in around the fire they knew where it was going to be they had to know where it was going to be I mean if it was so close to them man we'd wipe them out and that had happened one time and that's a scary thing at two o'clock in the morning the guy yells you're you're on us you're hitting us and we would call to the rear of the guns march that's the one command any any uh, artillery man does not want to hear because that's a scary thing so the sergeant of the guns would call to the rear of the gun march and not all, not everybody would come out, but it would be the four, three guys that were on that gun that they had to stand at the gun and verify the, the charges because when they pulled the charge out, they would throw it in this direction. So you had to verify it was charge four. You had to go back to the guns and verify the coordinates, make sure that that was correct. And the, and the sergeant was in charge of all of that to make sure that you didn't shoot out and you had the wrong coordinates. Because at two o'clock in the morning, when you're spinning that gun, they usually set it. They, use, they Because we gave that command to every gun for every squad. And this gun took care of that one, or these two took care of that, these two took care of that, and this one took care of that, and you had one guy by himself. So we already had it cranked up, ready to go, so that if we had a fire mission, they didn't have to fuss with it in the dark. And there's four bags? No, there's seven, seven, seven eight, 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 eight charges. Eight, eight char charges. How about what are charges? Uh, powder charges or bags, like sand, like your bean bags, you know, they're about bigger than your bean bag, but each one of those had the same amount of gunpowder in it. But when you would put them together, it would boost the projectile to the right the height and okay. length of where you need to land it. And they had a string between them. And then when the, when, the, when the command came down to the sergeant, he would relay all that information to each person in charge of his position on that gun. So one guy was in charge of the, uh, so he got the, he got the command, Hotel Echo. And the guy ran right over to where he had the projectiles. He'd pull it out. And uh, then they would say, and then you take the, uh, you take the canister away from the head or the bullet and in the canister were eight charges so he would say four so he'd count out four and leave four in and he'd throw the four over there and he'd put the project uh, put the canister back onto the projectile and he himself would give it to the other guy and he would ram it it wasn't the hard you just close the door on it not like a torpedo in a, in a navy boat and by that time he was repeating back the commands that was given from fire direction center to the sergeant. He was repeating back to the sergeant, four bags, Wilson, uh, hotel echo. And this guy would say quadrant four, deflection five. And you knew exactly what was going on. So the sergeant was responsible to make sure that each one of those three other people had it right. Well, they designed the guns, which was very unique. They have never done that until Vietnam. Usually the, the uh, howitzers, if you look at any of the, pa any of the things in the, in the uh, papers or in the movies, or that, had split tails. So what that was is the split tails you would have to anchor this tail and anchor this tail with a rod so it would hold itself in place because that's the only thing that would hold that gun. Well, after a number of rounds, you have to check it. It's just like a, just like a steering wheel. It can go out and, and, you're t and you, it could pull this way or pull that way. So you constantly had to check your, your weapon to make sure that that it hasn't moved from from the bearings that you gave it well it was so hard because where we were landing sometimes there was too much mud all right i'll wait well keep going i can hear you here just be loud bogus call okay you all right i'm, I'm fine 
All right, so they designed another gun. Basically, they kept the gun. They just designed the, the support mechanism or a chassis that this gun sat on. And instead of having two split tails coming out both sides behind the gun, they rounded it and put a big wheel in it. A big, big wheel is maybe about four foot wide. And that way they could spin the gun real quick for any, any fire mission that was involved. And you didn't have to really anchor it or take your deflections and your quadrants because you knew the gun was stable. Because what you did is you drove stakes in the anchor plate underneath the gun. All you had to do is pick this up and spin it. Much easier to work with because sometimes the soil was, was swampy. It could have been hard as rocks. Um... We tried to clear it off as much as we could with the engineers because they went first with the bulldozers and, and leveled out a, a pear pit for us. So that was a blessing to have that thing. Plus, it was a lot easier to sling up with the, uh, with the helicopters because there was a hook built into the gun in the back. And you just snap that in there and the whole thing would lift right up and you didn't have to worry about tucking in the tails so that they would be flaring around. So, at night time, the missions are all, everybody's quiet, everything's set. Sometimes the guys didn't, they didn't get to where they were supposed to get. So maybe, maybe 7.30 at night when it was dark. And that's tough. Because now they're trying to look in a flashlight, look at where they are. Or send a command back to the fire direction center. And then we repeat with a Wilson Pickett. We repeat with a Hotel Echo. And by that time, the gooks had set in. So you don't know whether they're observing where these things are. And they could, they simply did that. So anyway, at nighttime, these things took place. And um, Sometimes they thought they heard somebody out there, but they didn't. What it was was an elephant. So they didn't know it. They heard this thing come through the woods, you know. And they, and they, they had elephants? Oh, yeah. That's how the, that's how the North Vietnamese would pack, pack their supplies on these elephants. That's hilarious. Did and the one? only reason why we found that out is because they had some real sharp rangers or green berets that were trained to look for markings of, of whatever they used to transport their, their supplies and their ammo. But halfway up on, not halfway up, but about four, four or five foot up on a tree, you could see brush marks where the elephants, when they walked, they would sway back and forth and they would rub the trees. So you see these marks in the trees. And that's why they knew you had elephants. Not all of them, but some did. If they had a lot of... If they had a lot of equipment and they were a big, big company coming at us, that's one thing we wanted to know. So anyhow, that night at about 2 o'clock, we had other things going on, but the biggest one was that. 2 o'clock in the morning, you hear it. And I just got off a shift. I was, I was just got in and I was laying down. And I knew when I heard that sound, it was, it was jet, no, mortars. It was right. just a matter of fact before mindset. anything would hit. Um, and, mortars? and what mortars are, um, like they're like tubes. They're like, a, they're like a, a bazooka, but they're tubes yeah. with little rockets in them. Like you fired at me today. Oof. That's what they look like, little rockets. Well, these gooks, they, they didn't care how they did it. They weren't precise. They they weren't trained like the United States military. Was. They would just stick the tube down like that, and they and the guy would load them up, and then he would just kind of position it and try to guess how far out he was from. Phones there. So that's how they did that. And when you heard about 30, 30 of those coming at you, you know you're going to get in trouble big time real quick. Thirty of them, huh? Well, not maybe not thirty, but. That yeah, night there was a lot. Right? And I'd just gotten yeah, off a shift. And um, I heard them land. 
and they landed between these two. The captain had had a, a bunker or had a, a, cul a culvert, and then it, it, in the fire direction center in our circle within there, and there must have been three or four. There had to be three to four others, and these mortars landed. Most, some of them. Not all of them, they landed all over, but there was four that landed right dead center in our sleeping quarters. And you could hear go, fizz, fizz, fizz. I heard that. Don't ask me why. I think, it, I think the Holy Spirit said just roll down. I rolled off the bunk. We had a bunk in there. I rolled off the bunk on the ground, threw my flight jacket over my head. A flight jacket's a piece of garment that was issued to us. Everybody was issued that. So that if any you had any snipers or something like that and you're out on the guns, you have a vest. It's a protective vest like they have today for the for the policemen. Well it was I think the ones today are much better and lighter, but we had heavy ones, yeah. It would protect you from shrapnel. Well these guys were just were still on duty and whether they came out to see what was going on, whether they were running for cover, uh, I don't know. But all at once I heard this screaming and hollering and crying. Ah, I'm hit, I'm hit, I'm hit. Well, Don Davis was in my, was in my um, hooch with me. And he said, I'm not going out. I said, Don, I said, the men are hurt. I said, we are going out. We're going out to see. Oh, they're still shooting. At I said, Don, put your flight jacket on. I grabbed him by his flight jacket and I yanked the heck out of him. I said, we're going out. I said, these men, these men are hurt. We got to take them into cover. I said, we'll pick up the pieces later on. Right now, let's find out what happened to them. So we get out there and Lieutenant Tinkin, that was Tinkum. That was his name. He was hit. He was hit in the stomach, or he was hit in, hit in the face with the shrapnel. He was, he was cut in his eyes. He wound up being totally blind. The other guy, the shrapnel tore through his stomach, and the stomach was hanging out. And there was other guys that were wounded in their legs and so forth. And uh, we grabbed the hold of him, and I said, Don, get over here and help me. We grabbed a hold of these guys and we pulled them under cover to see what happened. And then we had to then we had to pick up their job because they were hurt. So we had to go back in the fire fire direction center because they were on shift and we weren't. But we we didn't get much rest that night because we heard gooks in the wire. Get your guns. So, so after we pull them out, we're standing guard with our with our M16s and the 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 uh, grunts that. We had grunts. We had military infantry guys. They took care of around us, around the uh, barbed wires. They set up the trip mines, um, the flares. They had machine guns on the borderline. And we, as the artillery, depended upon them. But when they said we're overrun, and they screamed back to us, beehives, please. Hurry with them. They dug themselves down in their foxholes. We leveled the guns. We blasted them. So they knew there was about to be a lot of fire over their heads. And so they would yell for them and then just get the heck down. That's exactly right. Because these guns were level, right level with the ground. And they don't want to send them right out. So what we so did they is... they just jumped in these holes. Well, they don't come out of the holes. They stay in the holes all night. Mm -hmm. But their heads are above the hole and they can see them coming. Well, we saw these flares going off that they sent off. They asked us to give them Wilson pickets. So straight up in the air, so we swung the gun the barrel right up in the air. There's about three guns that did that and shot flares in the air so it lit up the whole area so we could see where they're coming from. Where they come from north, south, east, or west, behind us, wherever. We were surrounded. We were surrounded. And then they sent out. They sent their uh, flares. Then you could hear the trip mines uh, go off. Bang! You know, you could hear it. That's so you knew they were in the wires. So all of a sudden, like, these mines go off and they're walking Well, on. they have wires. They, they hook claymore mines. They hook them up to trees. 
uh, ahead of time before the wires, or they blow the wires apart, so they go out and they hook them to trees around them with trip stings, uh, trip uh, wire. So if anybody tripped one, you knew the guys were coming in the next step where they'd be in the wire. So we heard those, they heard those first. We didn't get a chance to hear too much of that because we were in the center, but we could hear things going off. We could see lights going up. We knew we were getting something. And then um, we leveled the guns. We fired, we fired left, we fired left, we fired center, we fired right, and we came back to center again to see if there were more coming this way. This gun did the same thing, so we were protected 360. And then after all of that happened, nobody got out. Nobody wanted to see who was dead and what. They were, we didn't know. We didn't know whether we were going to get another wave. Everything was quiet. The machine guns stopped. Everything was quiet. She didn't say anything about how. And then we, and then we, and then we, we called it. And then, then the captain grabbed the horn. That's the, the phone. And he called in for air support. And not too, not too far after that, the Cobra ships came out. That's the helicopters that I was telling you about that have the 50 millimeter guns on a spinner on both sides of them. And they have rockets attached to them. And they came out. And uh, they started uh, picking up all whatever was left or was crawling. They started as much as they could see because we kept shooting up white phosphorus so they could see. And the helicopters had a big picture just like you were doing with this thing that you made here you could get an overall picture of everything and they could pick off anybody that was still moving there what do you mean an overall picture remember how you made this thing this castle or whatever seth was doing on here you could zoom in and zoom out mm -hmm. you don't remember him making that making what the helicopters have a screen that allows them to see night vision I don't know if they had it back then, but they do now. They have they, it now. We didn't have night vision. They can zoom in and pick off anybody that's still... They have... They, I don't know what all... I sat in one. I sat in a Cobra ship that landed. We were all excited just to see it and to see how it worked and try to understand it. But I didn't pay a heck of a lot of attention to the cockpit. But there were two guys in there. And... Um, they probably had sophisticated stuff enough that they could zero in and zero out with whatever and and you could see but they were fast i mean they 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 had to keep themselves low so they wouldn't be picked off by mortars uh by rocket launchers uh and they didn't stay around and they started shooting way the heck out because those 55 millimeter guns they could really come in and they could chop trees down they could level an area without a batting an eye and all the smoke. A lot of times we would shoot off um, <coughs> smoke grenades sometimes just to cover us and let them have total exposure to what was around us. So you guys had colored smoke. You could say puffing green or puffing blue. Or yeah, whatever. and we did that. We used to do that too. Well, we had we had a mortar we had a mortar patrol that was with us. We had laws, and I I had an op, I had an opportunity to shoot a law. You put it on your shoulder, and it's like a rocket launcher. And then we had uh, bazookas. That was a neat little thing. Hand grenade guns. It's just a short little weapon. You cock it and you put a big fat shell in it. And you load that thing up, and it's like a shotgun but it's more powerful. The shell's about that big in diameter. And boy, and I'll tell you, that really blasts anything that's out there. All of those were used that night, let me tell you. And the 60 millimeter guns on, on, the, uh, on the walls of the parapet, they were used. We didn't have any 50s because that was too heavy of a gun to, to, to launch. But the guy that was in Vietnam, he used to carry the... the uh, my friend that was in Vietnam, he used to carry the 60 millimeter. He was a big guy. They had all kinds of bandoliers on them with all the, all the shells. But we get replenished in the morning after we figured out how many shells we spent. And you could count those real easy because all the shells were laying over here. And there was a guy that one of the guys, the low guy in the um, in, in the in the bat in the squad, his job was to keep that 
hair pit clean because you don't want to have to stumble over the shells. They're, they're big. They're about that much in diameter. And he would police them and get them out of the way because if we had to spin the guns, we had to set up again. So there's a guy that was the lowest on the totem pole, and he used to do that. So you got your commendation, though, for going out and pulling those guys to safety that had gotten injured. Yeah, for bra for bravery. I that got was the relief crew that took your spot when you went off duty, right? So yeah. there were four guys. Yeah. So yeah. the watch, the watch took shrapnel from those mortar rounds that came in. Right, right. There were some other guys that were, they were running around, which to me is dumb, because you don't know where that shrapnel's flying. The, the worst thing you want to do is stick your head out. You get cut right in the neck with some of those things flying so the guys off the that, mortars. the guys that were hit, did you, or was there a medic that then took care of radio back for the helicopter? Yeah, we yelled, yep, we yelled medic, and uh, we had a medic with us. Uh, he came over to him, and then we had the men of X come in uh, after the gunships went around and got them, and they, they, they landed. They got them taped up enough, and none of them died right there, at least? Yeah. I think there was maybe one or two guys that were seriously injured, other than the two I told you about with the ripped stomach and the blinds. Uh, but they transported them back to the base. I, we never saw them again, so they were pretty well beat up. So those guys got shipped back home? Uh, possibly. But the guy with the stomach could have survived, maybe. Yeah, but I, nine chances out of ten, they don't always let those guys go back out. But there is a guy, there is a guy that I met that graduated below me from high school, and he was hit three times, and they patched him up and sent him back out. But he yeah. wasn't, he wasn't hit. He wasn't hit bad. He no. wasn't hit that bad, no. But he can tell you stories. Every time you meet him, he keeps telling you stories. Yeah, well, letting your stomach see the light of day seems to be an injury that might send you home. Well, that's true. Um, well, I think it's time for dinner. And on that note. And on that note. Let's